All right, thank you, Joyce. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, uh, water resources in North Dakota, especially in West, uh, Western North Dakota. Uh, this presentation, we're going to have uh, two parts. And the uh, first one is about, uh, you, you can see that uh, it's about divination and uh, modeling uh, related to prior portal region, PPR. Uh, the second topic, Dr. Lin, uh, he's going to talk about the water supply and the management. That topic will be related to oil production, because both topics, they are very important in North Dakota. Uh, first, why do we have interest in the first topic about delineation and, and modeling for, uh, especially for potholes and wetlands? Uh, this is uh, very interesting. Uh, I want to start from the general uh, modeling practice. For example, we talked about a lot about the watersheds. And uh, this part is about the Missouri River watersheds, Missouri River watershed uh, basin. Within this, this is a huge basin. Within this basin, there are many small tributaries, small basins. And uh, often, we, we, need to do what, we need to do watershed modeling. Uh, what's the meaning? That means the general practice always we need DEM. Based on DEM, we can do delineation, we can determine flow directions, or accumulations. And then, based on that, we can do hydrologic modeling or water quality modeling. So this is a general step. But then the problem for this general practice, modeling practice, in traditional method is uh, uh, pre-processing. Generally, before modeling, we have one step called pre-processing. What's the meaning? That means, for this kind of modeling, we cannot deal with depressions. If you have any depressions on land surface, pre-processing is going to fill all depressions. Then it's going to develop a depressionless DEM. Your hydrologic modeling and the water quality modeling will be based on depressionless DEM. What's the consequence? For example, we, I, I talked about uh, PPR, prior portal region. There are many depressions, uh, portal lakes, wetlands. In this case, clearly this method will not work. So because of this, in recent years, we worked on, we developed some new method we call the PD, Part of the Nation Program. And this method later, we, we modified, uh, we call the D-cubed method. That means uh, we will not feel depressions. So down here, you can see in the lower, there are many depressions, potholes. We, we're going to keep. Also, we're going to simulate in dynamics and their hierarchical relationships. Uh, so this is the basic idea about this method. You can see uh, on the left-hand side, the whole idea, we're going to handle the nation, we're going to identify all depressions, and also we're going to simulate their dynamics. Basically, we call the depression feeding, and uh, going to reach threshold, gonna, we're going to have uh, over, we're going to have uh, speeding, and also merging, that means if two depressions, they're going to share one threshold, and they, they're going to merge into a big depression, a big, like, a big uh, puddle. And also, if level is going to decrease, they, we, we're going to see some separation. So this is the whole idea. Now we developed this uh, windows-based program. This is going to include the delineation and modeling. And basically, we input all data through, win uh, through the uh, Windows interface. Now you can do simulation, you can look at some, uh, summarize the tables, and also can create some figures, look at the depressions, and also do simulation. How land surface, over land, are gonna flow on land surface? How depressions are gonna, will be filled? Uh, then we test this program, we select many sites in North Dakota. Uh, this is one of them. This site is located in uh, Cottonwood Lake area. This is within PPR. And uh, for delineation, the major DEM, we use 10 meter DEM. Let, let's, do, let's do delineation using this program. And of course, in the program, going to do delineation, going to determine all topographic parameters. For example, slope, and the flow directions, accumulations, and all details. By the end, we divide this area into many different small, small basins. You can see uh, the largest one should be basin 11, B11, and B16. And on the right-hand side, you can see the delineation results. And there are many 
uh, portals also we identified and also we looked at their connections. And there are many different levels. And then let's do the simulation. You can see here simulation results. We want to understand what can happen if we have room for input on this land surface. How depressions will be filled. You can see the whole process starting from the very beginning A, this is initial condition, then gradually some depressions will be filled and also reaching the threshold, some are gonna spill and also merge into bigger one. And until the last one, we have fully filled condition. And based on this, of course, you know the uh, maximum depression storage, MDS, and uh, all simulation details. Also, next topic I want to highlight, uh, hydrologic connectivity. Because of this, in the very beginning, there are so many isolated, localized system. Uh, and then, during this process, you can see the connected area, gradually the number is going to decrease, the area is going to increase. You can see the evolution of the contributing area. And also, I want to highlight one point based on the simulation. That means uh, threshold control and uh, also stepwise change. From the lower figure, you can see the stepwise change because of threshold control. And then we applied this model for uh, two time periods in 2019. And one is in spring, total 1,000 hours. You can see the rainfall distribution. For this one, the, we have some dry time period. What is going to happen? Similarly, down here, you can see the simulated uh, depression storage uh, variations. And also, you can see stepwise change. For dry time period, you can see uh, decreasing, and also during the rainfall period, you can see increasing, both wet and dry. And uh, for both periods, you can see stepwise change because of the threshold control. And for 4, 2019, this is the second uh, 1,000 time uh, hour period. This, uh, we, we, you can see we have heavy rainfall. And uh, this condition, basic trend, you can see increase. Of course, for dry time, uh, short dry time period, also you can see some decrease. Again, also we can see stepwise change. And uh, the last topic for this study, I want to highlight one point. That means for watershed modeling, in the beginning we talked about we need DEM. DEM you can get from USGS, right? Before, several years ago, generally people use 30 meter DEM. That means resolution. One grid, 30 by 30. And in recent years, of course, you can download the 10 meter DEM, very popular. Even for some area, you can get a higher resolution DEM. But in the big question for watershed modeling, hydrological water quality modeling, which DEM will be good for you? Do I need one meter or two meter? Do I need five meter? Or can I use 90 meter DEM? This is a big question. Then we did a scale analysis. And based on scale analysis, this results can tell you how to write, select the right DEM. For example, we looked at the two meter DEM, the left hand side, and then the middle one, 10 meter, and 30 meter, and 90 meter, four different DEM resolutions. What we found, if you look at this, you can find, then we calculate uh, uh, correlation length, and also calculate DEM scale factor, then this uh, lambda. Lambda, you can see the equation, and based on this, we create uh, lambda versus some topographic parameters and hydrologic variables, for example, even outflow. And let's look at the relationship for these four figures. You can see 10 meter DEM, it, it will be good enough to do the simulation. And then the first one, two meter, actually we don't need. And that means you can reduce the computation load. However, if you're going to increase the, the DEM resolution to 30 meter or 90 meter, on the right-hand side, you can see the last two, clearly you're going to see huge changes. Actually, this is the power function, because this is logarithm. So, what's the meaning? That means, based on this scale analysis, we can see, for this case, 10 meter should be perfect. You don't need a higher resolution. However, if you move to coarse resolution to 30 and 90, that you're going to, you will not get the right simulations. Uh, so this conclusion is very important. Basically, for this one, I want to highlight, for example, uh, for wetlands and potholes, and the surface topography is very important, and we should consider uh, depression feeding, speeding, merging, and uh, this dynamic 
these dyna dynamic processes. And clearly, this kind of dynamics can affect portholes port uh, port and also wetlands, wetland functions. And also, I want to highlight again threshold behavior because of topographic control, because of this uh, uh, portal, their con uh, dynamic connections. And also rainfall events, you can see, gonna affect the, the whole system. And uh, so this, uh, I would say, this is the foundation for future watershed modeling and even ecological modeling. And if you want to address some issue about the ecosystem, we should understand what's going on for this, under these kind of conditions. Uh, this is my presentation. We have some publications about the uh, studies uh, about these uh, topics. And uh, this, this, project, this project has been funded by National Science Foundation. One is the NSF Korea, and another one is the EPSCO in recent years. So second part, Dr. Lin is going to talk about uh, uh, water supply and, uh, and management. Thank you, Dr. Chu, and good, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, so I will, in the um, next maybe 10 to 12 minutes, I would like to uh, share some uh, snapshot about water issues related to hydraulic fracking in Bakken region in the uh, western North Dakota, specifically water resources impact and the water resources management. So that is the um, Bakken region in um, um, Western North Dakota and also Montana. Uh, the shaded area is the Bakken region. Uh, you can see that um, of, um, Missouri River flow through that region and the green dots represents more than 10,000 uh, high uh, horizontal um, Bakken wells. And eight, more than 85% of those wells are located in this uh, four county region we call four county core areas. Um, uniquely, and very interestingly, um, that the water used for hydraulic fracking activities uh, in western North Dakota is distributed through uh, water depots. Um, there are water depots using surface water um, that, um, that's uh, denoted uh, as the uh, blue tri uh, triangles, and those wa water depot use uh, groundwater source, that's uh, um, the um, red circles. Um, that's the uh, water depot, of uh, groundwater depot. Uh, you can see the oil tank, uh, the, the water tanker come in to fill in the water, and this is the uh, typical uh, surface water depot. So from 2007, 2008, which we consider is the recent oil boom started uh, in uh, Western North Dakota to the recent years, the uh, water used uh, related to hydraulic fracking activities that's sold by the uh, water depots, uh, including well stimulation uh, or, or uh, hydraulic fra fracking per se, and, in, and also um, oil drills, uh, well drills, and the cementing, and also um, brine uh, dilution, we also call that maintenance um, of, of water. So that water um, demand or increase from uh, 2007, 2008 to recent years increased more than 20 times. So that's a huge um, increase in terms of the water demand. Um, in order to meet this demand, the unpre unprecedented water demand, so the state of uh, North Dakota, they. Uh, formed these five major uh, water management policies. The first one is authorize the western area uh, water supply to the that's kind of uh, rural area uh, water supply uh, project. Normally, typically, this type of project need to wait for uh, federal government to uh, provide some matching fund. So in this case, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the state legislature, they allow the project to sell up to 20% of the uh, project water for hydraulic fracking to finance the uh, project itself. So kind of like we do not have to have the uh, financial uh, aid from the federal government. And the second one is related to uh, water uh, permit transfer. So allow those cities in that region can, can sell the excess water. Um, typically used for um, municipal water supply and to, to uh, 
to gener generate some uh, um, CG revenue. The third one is also related to uh, permit transfer that allow individual uh, farmers. They have uh, irrigation permit. They can forego some uh, irrigation permit uh, per uh, use and to sell the uh, water for hydraulic fracking. Um, that, that, those two uh, you have renew uh, yearly, so that's temporary. And then the, the fourth one is uh, actually um, is more um, ne negotiation between the state of uh, North Dakota and Un uh, U.S. Army Corp. of Engineers. So the Lake Sakakawea surplus water is managed, managed by the um, uh, Army Corp. of Engineers, but they gave uh, five years plus another five years renewable um, temporary uh, access to the state of North Dakota. And the last one is um, the Office of State Engineers started to issue more, actually considerably, uh, more temporary water permit um, to, uh, for hydraulic fracking purpose and uh, since 2012. Um, um, but this one does not guarantee uh, the uh, water rights, so it's easy for them to, um, to, apply, uh, to, to approve those um, permit apply. So for this, <laughs> I only have five minutes, but I'll try to be a, a, um, finish up. So, so the objective is one, we want to look at the uh, water resource impact in the region uh, from the hydraulic fracking activities. Second one, we want to look at the um, uh, water management policies, whether they are effective or not. Um, for first objective, we basically just do the data analysis. We collect a lot of data. And the second one, we use agent-based modeling. We not only we have data, but also we interview uh, the um, constituents or stakeholders, uh, including um, managers, uh, water managers, the hydrologists, and the uh, water evil owners. And we have this poster uh, related to agent-based modeling. Um, we, um, how significant is this hydraulic water use uh, compared to the other um, water use in the uh, state of North Dakota? So we have three per uh, uh, percentages. The short one is we compare uh, hydraulic water use versus the total water use in the entire North Dakota state. You can see that the uh, percentage increase from almost zero to about 10%. And then in the western North Dakota, that's um, 16 counties that all have oil producing uh, ca capability. So that percentage increased from less than maybe 1, 2% to uh, 25%. But in that four county core area, that percentage increased from less than 5% to uh, 40%. So that's uh, significant. If we zoom in to look at the four county core area, like we look at all different types of water uses. Um, I don't have time, but I, I just want to draw your attention to that. Although the total uh, water use is increasing of, uh, in, in the past few years, but the irrigation water use is actually decreasing, I think, apparently due to uh, the uh, irrigation uh, water permit uh, tra transfer. And in terms of water sources used for that, uh, for hydraulic fracking, uh, about 50-50. 50% is from groundwater, 50% is from surface water. But in 2012, that trend shift. So we used more groundwater um, in the past, before 2012, and now we use more surface water after 2012. So that's the impact on stream flows. Uh, we collect data, f uh, we, not we collect it, we, uh, that there are a USGS stations, that 12 USGS uh, stations in that region. They have data from 2000, at least from 2000 to 2014. So we divide that period into two time period, and we uh, compare the seven day annual low flow before oil bone and after oil bone. Now you can see that um, probably you, are, you, you imagine that um, the uh, seven day annual low flow will decrease, but instead of decrease, actually increase. Increase not only uh, a little bit, increase at least 80%. For, um, I think the one uh, small, uh, small increase is uh, this one, that's 80%. So almost, not almost all the uh, 12 uh, uh, stations have um, uh, in has increased. And then we look at the uh, groundwater. Um, there are 210 uh, observation wells that have recorded from, at least from 2000 to uh, 2014. 
and we did the same thing to compare the groundwater uh, levels. You can see uh, the um, warm, warm color is, we see the groundwater level decreasing, and we see the, um, the cold color, that's, we see the groundwater level increasing. So you can see uh, for the bedrock, the deep aquifer, uh, those uh, groundwater level actually uh, were uh, decreasing, but that not related to hydraulic fracking activities because that's very minimal uh, water used uh, from the, uh, for, for the hydraulic fracking from the um, deep aquifer. But for the shallow aquifers, uh, we see most of the um, uh, uh, wells, uh, we see the uh, water level increasing, but only three um, what aquifers that's within that's four county area. So that's uh, Chabonnet, um, Tobacco Garden Creek, and also this Kildeo, we have this uh, seen the groundwater level decreasing. So that's, uh, I think, is um, affected by the uh, hydraulic fracking activities. Um, yes, thank you. So mainly, I think the one of the of factor we see, the, instead of decreasing uh, stream flow, decreasing groundwater, we see higher uh, increasing groundwater and uh, increasing stream flow is because this region was blessed by uh, more than 20% increase in precipitation. So we have this, um, uh, there's 11 uh, gauge stations, you can see that, we uh, compare a uh, similar comparison. Um, now we want to look at the water policy evaluation. So we have five water policy, major policy. So we simulate, we have five, um, um, five six uh, scenarios. Scenario zero is baseline scenario, that's no, uh, that's, we have these five policy in place. Um, we compare them, uh, the, the other uh, scenarios, that's if, what if we without have this uh, policy. So we look at the two uh, aspects. One is how much water shortage gonna, gonna create if we do not have that, uh, didn't have that water policy. And then another second one is uh, what, um, how much permit violation gonna have. Um, we can see that policy 135, they are more important than the policy two and four. So that's the kind of ranking of water policy and give you a review of what these uh, policies are. Uh, I think that's, that's what I have. And the, for, con for the uh, re water resource impact that um, we see more than, kind of like up to 40% of total water use, um, uh, uh, that, that water use for hydraulic fracking, 40% uh, uh, of total water use in that four county area are um, um, hydraulic fracking water use, and although uh, that's significant, but still limited impact on uh, regional supply. And then we uh, kind of look at these uh, three most important uh, water policies that's uh, implemented by the state of uh, North Dakota. And, and also would uh, acknowledge that North, uh, National Science Foundation for the support. Thank you.